I had to relocate from where we were based out of to another location to be closer to the target. We called it and it took about, about 90 minutes to two hours time of the flight for the missiles. And during this whole time, we can call in to divert the missile five minutes before it hits. So we can call and say, hey, he's no longer there. You can divert. Uh, so we, we kept checking till the missile was about to hit. Welcome to Combat Story. I'm Ryan Fugit, and I serve war zone tours as an Army attack helicopter pilot and CIA officer over a 15-year career. I'm fascinated by the experiences of the elite in combat. On this show, I interview some of the best to understand what combat felt like on their front lines. This is Combat Story. Today we have an amazing combat story with someone from the very elite Special Missions Unit community who is part of an organization still referred to only as the unit for operational security purposes, Adam Gomal. Not to be confused with Delta Force, which is also often referred to as the unit, this SMU blended intel and special operations in combat and non-combat theaters and remains highly secretive and rightly so. Adam recently wrote a fantastic book, the first about this organization, titled The Unit My Life Fighting Terrorists as One of America's Most Secretive Military Operatives that details the experiences of someone operating in the shadowy, kinetic, and clandestine world so other fellow unit operators would have something they could point to, much the way Dev Grew and Delta can, to explain the great work they did by referencing other excellent books written about those experiences. Since the work remains so secretive, however, you'll notice we've implemented some controls to protect Adam's identity including not clearly showing his face on camera and distorting his voice. We're able to vouch for Adam's experience thanks to previous guests who know him personally and worked with him directly in combat. Additionally, Adam's book went through the lengthy publication review process with DOD, indicating his story is in fact legitimate. With that, please enjoy this amazing story from an epic and very unlikely upbringing in Egypt to being ambushed downrange, shot in the stomach, surveilling HVTs, and delivering missile strikes that have a 90-minute time of flight, and more from one of the very, very few cleared to talk about their experiences. Adam, thanks so much for taking the time to share your story with us today. Uh, Ryan, thank you for inviting me to share my story. And just for people who are watching and listening, they will notice that, for those watching, that we can only see a dark silhouette of of yourself in a fairly dark room. And on the voice side, there's some distortion added to your voice, all of this for for your own personal security. But um, I think many people would wonder, because this is also related to a lot of the experiences you have in your new book, The Unit. And they might ask, why is it you have the book, but you're worried about personal security? And I thought we'd you know address that first and foremost. So over to you, Adam, on, on it on the personal security side of this? So it's a personal security, unit security, um, uh, mission security as well. So it's not just my own security, it's the security of the guys who serve with me, uh, the security of the guys who are currently serving uh, in the organization, and uh, the security of my family. Uh, Based on uh, things we've done in the past, based on things are going on now, uh, based on I do travel with my current job, so I wanted to uh, make sure that everybody around me is protected. Exactly. And um, just for people listening um, who might think, oh, is this guy for real? We have absolutely verified Adam's background with uh, with some other folks that we know. So you're, you're hearing from the real deal here. And the book has been reviewed by DOD. It's a very interesting read. Um, but it has been reviewed and there's areas that are redacted as you see in many agency and military books that DOD or the agency has looked at. So just to, to comment on what you said about the book yes. went through a review and the redaction. So actually it took us over uh, 12 months uh, with the book being reviewed. Uh, I wanted to first thank DOD, thank the process, uh, thank unit leadership, uh, SOCOM leadership, JSOC leadership, uh, and after they redacted uh, quite a few things out of the book, uh, rather than us fighting over it, uh, I asked for uh, a meeting with them. I uh, came to the Pentagon. I sat for about four hours with uh, security personnel from uh, different uh, organizations under the JSOC umbrella, including the JSOC uh, security, including SOCOM, 
as well as unit. Uh, and here I wanted to differentiate between the unit. Uh, a lot of people believe the unit is Delta. Well, there there are a few organizations called a few organizations uh, called the unit just uh, because the actual name of the organization is uh, classified. So uh, I wanted to start by saying that. Then uh, let me move to take you back a bit to Egypt. Uh, so I uh, grew up in a very humble background. Uh, I was uh, born in Alexandria, Egypt. And uh, as a kid, I uh, think I was crazy enough to do stupid things like a lot of us, I guess, when we were kids, we do that. So I, uh, a few things happened to me from being part of the Boy Scouts to uh, playing basketball, although I'm very short, to being stupid enough to jump in the Mediterranean in January uh, without understanding what I'm doing. And uh, my cousin, I think, was looking for me. That one, my family thought they lost me. So they sent everybody from the family out to look for that very tiny, small kid. I think I was like six or seven uh, at that time. And uh, I got uh, asthma from that. I got, I was like in some shots to help me breathe. And the doctor told my mom that I'm not going to make it past 11 or 12 years old. Uh, well, I guess I, uh, I, approved, I proved that guy wrong. Uh, then growing up more uh, in Egypt, uh, playing basketball, playing chess, being in the Boy Scouts. A lot of people think like, well, the Boy Scouts, the Boy Scouts of America. Well, actually, there is a bigger Boy Scout organization worldwide. Uh, that helped me a lot in preparing me for the military without knowing. Uh, then I have a lot of uh, encounters with uh, different Muslim organizations. So Alexandria is the second largest city in Egypt, as a lot of people know. So the government focused a lot, the government of Egypt focused a lot on uh, Cairo. But imagine you as a kid growing up during uh, the Afghan-Soviet Union war. So at the same time, Alexandria, extremely metropolitan city. We had a lot of people from Mediterranean, other Mediterranean cities and countries. So we have uh, Greeks, we have French, we have Italians uh, living in our neighborhoods. We have the Jewish quarter in, in, in Alexandria as well. So we were very uh, mixed. But at the same time, in the 80s, we started seeing uh, Mujahideens actually walking in the streets of Alexandria as well, who went to Afghanistan, fought in Afghanistan, and then came back to Egypt. And then you start hearing the rhetoric and the stories and, and all these things. And you are a kid, you, you are in between. You're being pulled in both directions. And uh, as uh, people will see in the book, without the right guidance of my father, the right guidance of people around me, uh, maybe I would have ended up in, in the wrong place. Do you do you think so? Like you could have fallen in with the wrong crowd, maybe? It's it's always possible. So I I believe people fall into those crowds. People always looking at, uh, you know, like uh, you're always looking for a purpose in life. Even when you are a kid, you, you want to have a purpose in life. And if there is a void there, and not so nobody is guiding you to to fulfill your time and to keep you busy, uh, you might end up in in the wrong place. And I see people in in, in Iraq when I was helping with the interrogations of some of the, the foreign fighters, I've seen that. I, I did interrogate a 19-year-old 19 19 kid from Morocco who, uh, as I'm talking to him, and me understanding the culture, I was able to get through him, uh, sat with the kid on the floor, chatted, got him something to eat, then I started talking about his background, his family, and as soon as I told him, how do you think your mom will feel about you being here in jail he cried oh. uh so that's a kid who most likely if he had the right environment the right uh, guidance the right leadership the right and, and his dad he was uh he he was raised by a single mom his dad passed away when he was young so you see those things around so yes to answer your question most likely it, it's always possible if you if you were not guided by the right people how about your parents? Can you speak a little bit more about them and, and the upbringing that you had? Clearly very important, hardworking father um, and a mother that was really looking after you very closely. What was the, uh, what was the relationship like? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I'll uh, highlight this a bit. So my uh, father came from the countryside of Egypt. His father was uh, the mayor of the village. So he, although he came from, a, both my parents came from a rich family, but both my parents were poor. They moved from the countryside to Alexandria. 
seeking a better life uh, as far as a quality of life, not money wise. So the family not didn't cut them off, but they were like, okay, you want to go live there? We're not going to financially support you. Uh, so that started. And then uh, you have a father and a mother looking over your shoulder as hawks. Uh, I would be sitting in class in elementary school. And all of a sudden, uh, I see my father on his way back from work. He walks to the classroom and pulls the teacher aside. And he's like, um, how is he doing? And I'm like, please, God, just fucking take me out of this. I don't like the other kids will be like, oh, your father is here. And uh, it was very clear that he told the teacher more than once, like, if he does something wrong, you have my full permission to give him an ass whipping. Uh, I'm not sure if we can use the word ass in the uh, yeah, show, you can. but uh, you can. Yeah. hopefully military guys are okay with that. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and at the same time, I had uh, my mother who uh, passed away two years ago. My mother was, uh, uh, again, she uh, like getting a, 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 a whipping with a, a small tiny belt was okay as well. So if you make a mistake or not just making a mistake, if you show weakness, uh, she was very strong and she's like, if you cannot be weak. And since I was tiny, uh, my father was like, you cannot come across like a, a kid who can be bullied. Not saying it's right or wrong, but my father was like, hey, try not to fight. Make sure that you are avoiding every fight you can. However, if you have no choice but fighting, make sure you take the first punch. Wow. Uh, because then you're going you're gonna, to uh, take the, the guy against you off balance. So that's basically what you learn in the military too. You try not to fight and you try not, especially in the, in our unit, it was like, Hey, try to avoid like being in an area where you might get into a fight. But uh, if you, if you have to fight or you take your gun out, make sure that you not willing, willing and able and uh, committed to use it. So it's the same thing that if you are in a fight, make sure you take the first punch first, but avoid the fight. If you can. Yeah. Best. Uh, I think like Sun Tzu said, best wars are won without fighting a battle. Uh, sometimes you don't have the option. And I think I recall reading that your father didn't have kind of the formal education himself, but really was, you know, studied anything he could. And and so your education was paramount. But like many parents, right, who come from, from more humble uh, beginnings, they really want their kids to excel uh, in the education sense. Correct. So uh, not going to college was not an option on the table. Uh, so my father did not have formal education. My mother didn't have formal education. But uh, I remember very well that when you get your, uh, your report card at the end of the month, uh, my father will take it and look at uh, uh, three subjects, math, English, and science. And I have no idea why he picked those three subjects. And he would look at him and he's like, if you didn't do well in those three subjects, you suck. And then it could be like, uh, you get a lot of uh, punishments. And then people will say, well, if you were studying English in Egypt as a kid, how could you said you came to the U.S. not speaking English? Uh, so let me highlight this a bit. So before people get uh, confused. So in Egypt, uh, you, you, you learn like very uh, basic, basic, basic English where you like you say, what is your name? And then I say, my name is Adam. And uh, that's the basic that you learn. And then you don't learn how to speak. You don't learn how to You just memorize certain things. And then it comes in the exam and you're like, you know, what does book mean? And then you say, and they give you multiple choices and you say book means this in Arabic. But you don't have any conversational English. You don't have, unless you went to private school. And obviously we were not, uh, we didn't have enough money to go to private school. But uh, getting education and going to college was uh, non-negotiable. Any American will know this because that's how we learn Spanish in the U.S., which is like you take four years of it and you can't speak any of it by the end, basically. But... Can we talk just a little bit about um, the Muslim faith? Are you growing up around a, I would assume, maybe a religious environment? Is the family religious? What was that like as you're growing up? Uh, so everybody in the Middle East will say they are religious because religion is part of uh, their daily life. However, it's like any American family too. So you have different different levels of, you know, how do you go to pray five times a day? Or you pray at home or you pray in the mosque or what? So I would say my family was very moderate. They were not uh, extreme one way or another. And they picked on uh, more the stuff that teaches you discipline. So like fasting. I started to fast when I was eight. And my mom was like, you have to fast because it's going to teach you how to be disciplined. Uh, you're hungry and you want to eat. You're thirsty. You want to drink. 
But if you can stay without eating or drinking, that, that lesson will help you one day in the future. She didn't know that lesson will help me in selection, uh, but it did uh, yeah. because she didn't know that would be selection one day. The other thing too is really paramount for the family, although we didn't have uh, we didn't have money, we didn't have a lot of money, but charity was a big thing. Uh, mm-hmm. So I'll be walking with my dad in the streets. There is somebody sitting in the corner who's begging or doesn't have money. And rather my dad taking the money and going, going to give it to that person who will give me the money and say, go give that that guy something and it was a, a lesson that stuck with me the more you are, you're more, the more you have i think the more you and i don't want to i'm not preaching here it's just culture the more you have the more you can offer other people and the more you can help can you talk to us just about the decision to leave egypt how old are you at the time what's the discussion why do you do this i was in college in egypt i was studying law and a college professor was like hey everything that you guys study in most likely you will not practice in your lifetime because Egypt was under a state of emergency from uh, since the assassination of Sadat. And it, it seemed like it was going to keep going forever, which it did. It, it kept going until 2011. Uh, Sadat was assassinate, assassinated in uh, 1981. Y- you realize that you're not going to have the opportunity to be treated equally like everybody else because the law is not applied equally. You didn't have the right to dream. You didn't have uh, hope. When I was in... Uh, in college, me and, and two other guys uh, in the summer of 1990, 91, uh, we decided it's time to go. And uh, one guy wanted to come to the U.S. Another guy wanted to go to uh, France. And for some reason, I was thinking Vienna. I was like, you know, Vienna, they sing about Vienna. It's beautiful. And Austria. So we went saying. to the Austrian embassy. Yeah. Austria, Yes. So we went to the Austrian embassy and they were like, we're not giving visas unless you have an immediate family member and there. So we went to the French embassy and the French embassy were like, we're not giving visas to people from Egypt because of the first Gulf War, the iraq Kuwait War. There was like some instability and they're like, we're not giving visas. So in the way back, we walked in the way back. A friend was like, the, the third guy, he's like, I came with you guys to uh, those two embassies. We got to stop by the American embassy. And I was like, so those two embassies didn't give us a visa. Why do you think the U.S. Embassy will give us a visa? And he's like, well, let's just try. So there is a guard standing outside and we asked the guy for an application. So he gave us three applications, filled out the applications. And uh, next day we went. Uh, it was a lot easier back then to go apply for a visa. Uh, so we went and we walked into the, the embassy, the consulate, actually. The guy who uh, was wanted to go to the U.S. He was the guy actually with the money and the means and everything to be able to go to the U.S. Uh, me, I didn't have the money to pay for the visa. <laughs> so we walked in there and uh, ironically, they gave the third guy, they gave one of the guys a visa. With me, they said, you got to go get more paperwork and come back. Uh, and I uh, had to go get more extra paperwork to prove I can actually travel and to come back. And uh, my brother was like it was seven dollars i think or nine dollars was no seven dollars to uh to get a visa and my brother was like take this money and maybe they'll give it to you and i walked there and they give me a visa so i go back home and i tell my dad and he's like well no you have to finish college first and i was like well if i finish college here uh, this is ironic i was like if i finish college here i have to serve in the military here it's mandatory and i don't want to serve in the military and i want to leave so we had this discussion back and forth back and forth i was the youngest i looked like 14 uh, I had a nice afro at that time, and uh, I was literally 112 pounds, uh, five foot one inch tall. And uh, we went back and forth on this. Uh, my mom got involved. My mom gave me money to buy a ticket. My sister lent me $500. My, bro- my brother gave me the $7 for the visa. And a week after, I landed in New York City. No way. And you were only 14? I looked 14, but I was 20. Okay. I did look- <laughs> I gotcha. Let's talk about why you didn't want to go into the military in Egypt. Was it you, you just wanted to study law? You wanted to do something different with your life? Because obviously your life takes a very different turn when you're in the U.S. Correct. So the military in Egypt is different than the military in the U.S. The military in Egypt is uh, it's like mandatory. You, uh, you're not offered any of the opportunities uh, of the training, the education. The, uh, the U.S. is very flat culture. Uh, in Egypt is not. So a lot of people who served in the military in Egypt at that time, and I'm not, uh, I'm not criticizing or 
condone in the military in Egypt or in any country. I'm just saying at that time, it was not going to give me any of the opportunities I was looking for. Yeah. And it was going to take me to an older age. So most likely I was not going to be able to leave Egypt till I was uh, 24, 25. And I wanted to leave as soon as possible. So uh, that's why. And then people will be like, well, why did you join the military in Egypt? Uh, sorry, in the U.S.? Then we can go, we can get in yeah. that question later. The, go on yeah. we'll, we'll get to that. So like you arrive in the U S what's your experience like, um, what, who are you staying with? What are you doing? You're uh, presumably you're going to school. So, yes. So I did uh, apply to school to learn English. However, when I landed in the U S so I landed in uh, JFK and, uh, there is a bus takes you from JFK to, uh, the subway station. And then, and I have, uh, I got this international student ID because I was in college. And with the international student ID, they give you a booklet with all the places you can stay uh, economically, cheap, basically. So they gave me a booklet with the YMCAs. So I go land in New York City first. I'm trying to, with the two, three words I know in English, I tell the bus driver and I show him the address. And I'm like, I'm, I have no idea where I'm going. It was me and this other guy. The other guy didn't speak any English either. So I'm looking at it and I'm like, I wanted to, uh, to go to this address. And the guy got sick and tired of me, I guess. Finally, because I asked him four or five times because I'm like, I'm terrified. And it's July and it's raining and I've never seen rain in Egypt in the summer. So I'm like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> so they, uh, once I got, once he, he got sick and tired of me, he ended up taking the booklet and sitting me down. And he's like, just sit here. Then finally, the bus made it to the last stop where everybody gets off to take the subway. Then uh, I went and I bought a ticket, took the subway because I was supposed to go to the YMC and I had the address. My buddy gets in the subway and he's like, with a cigarette. And he's like, and everybody looking at us. And he's like, why are they looking at us? I was like, maybe because he's smoking. And he's like, no, 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 everybody smokes. And uh, like two, two tell, two tell, two tell fresh off the boot. Kids <laughs> who had no idea what's going on, had no clue what they're getting themselves into. Uh, and then we get off the subway. It's a Sunday. And I'm trying to get out of the subway. I'm trying to go up in the street. And you have uh, the, the turnstile. Sunday, a lot, of the, a lot of the doors and turnstiles are locked. So the police officer is standing there and he tells me like where to like just go there, go here, go upstairs, and this is how you go to the streets. And I try this two or three times and the things are locked. I go and I come back, go and come back. And I have my suitcase, I have my five hundred dollars hidden in my socks inside my shoes. Uh my buddy has his suitcase, my buddy doesn't speak English, smoking cigarettes in the subway station. <laughs> Finally, the police officer uh who told the guy to 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 take away to to throw away the cigarette. And then finally, the police officer ended up uh, walking me, holding me in my hands, walking me to the street. And he's like, well, now you are in the street. So in this, I looked at it as here is a, a bus driver who didn't understand anything I said. It's day one. He helped me to make it to the subway. And then here is a police officer, which in Egypt, you don't do a lot with police officers. They, you're scared of them. And here is this young, nice police officer walks me to the street. And I'm like, wow, these people are nice. And then I go to the YMCA and they take $50 out of my $500. So that's 10% for, uh, for your first couple of hours that you get to pay, right? <laughs> so I'm like, how the hell am I going to stay here? <laughs> and then uh, I had a friend of mine. He was with me in the Boy Scouts in Egypt. His mom gave me his phone number. She did not write the one before the area code. <laughs> so here I am in the YMCA with a pay phone, take quarters, put him there. To try to call the guy, the operator answers, and I don't understand what the operator said. And I'm terrified. I'm not gonna lie to you. I'm yeah. terrified, like scared of everything. Uh, it's my first day in New York. It's uh, it's in New York City. Yeah, of you're all the scared. places. You, exactly. You walk in the street and you see things that you're not accustomed to. I go back to the Y. I sit down. Go back to the room. It's a bunk bed. My buddy's sleeping. He's like, he doesn't know what's going on. But he's cool. He's like calm because he's counting on me. So I'm like, I don't know why that guy's counting on me. <laughs> because <laughs> I might just take him to drown with me. Finally, I think it was around 2 o'clock in the morning. Some guy in uh, standing by the bathroom in the YMCA. So they have these common bathrooms, like the one we had in the military. 
uh, this guy standing there and he decides, uh, I think he got sick and tired of me seeing me going back and forth, back and forth. Finally, he takes the piece of paper with, that I had with the phone number, puts the porter there, dial for me. And then my friend on the other side answered. And I breathed, I think for the first time. Wow. Uh, and then my friend was like, don't leave. Uh, just stay there. I'll come and pick you up tomorrow morning. So again, and I, I said it in the book, uh, a bus driver who never met me, uh, a police officer and a junkie helped me in my first night in, in the U.S. I can't even imagine how much you had to hustle to learn this language and live in this country at that time. Like, Can you just, what are some of the highlights of you getting up to speed at that age with the language, the culture, everything? Watching TV was one of them, uh, and then uh, you, you you pick it you pick on it right. So yeah. I, the first time I went to buy socks, and uh, I walked to a mall in uh, New Jersey, and I tell the lady standing there, I want to buy one like this, and she's like, "Say socks," and I'm like, "Socks," <laughs> or "Say socks." <laughs> so she, then she's like, "Well, this thing that you want to buy is called socks," and and uh, it it really helped me a lot too after I joined the military, because I've learned how to learn a language. And yeah. then I started taking uh, English as a second language classes uh, in Hunter College in New York. But uh, just your lack of understanding of the language, you go to the supermarket and you don't know even. Like the small yeah. things that a lot of people take for granted and you're like, how do I tell them like, I want to do this or I want to do that. So I finally I opened the bank account, another highlight. And you know, you go to the ATM machine and back then, you would uh, put the money in an envelope, write your bank account on an, on an envelope and slide the money in the machine, right? Well, I didn't know that. So I uh, wanted to put, I wanted to test it. I want to put $10. So I go and I do everything and I take the $10 and I put it in the machine without an envelope, without anything. Obviously, the, the $10 didn't show in my bank account. <laughs> so Jersey City, where I stayed a lot, was an interesting place because it did have a, a, a large Egyptian community. And the teller in the bank was an Egyptian lady. And I explained uh -huh. to her what happened. She obviously laughed her ass off. <laughs> and uh, she's like, let me show you. <laughs> and then she's like, yeah, and by the way, we found $10 there. Uh, one time I was playing cards with people. And, uh, and I'm like, uh, I have uh, ace, the card ace. Well, I didn't know ace, right? So I said ass uh, rather than saying ace. So I'm sitting with this guy, him and his wife, and we're playing. And he laughed his ass off at me. <laughs> And I'm like, and I was like, why are you laughing? He's like, it's not ass, it's ace. Then you learn those things. So you just slowly. learn. You just learn. Yeah, I, I was working all kind of jobs. So I uh, worked in a factory that does uh, handbags. I worked in a gas station. Uh, I worked in a ladies' sportswear store. I worked in a bakery. I delivered cakes. You name it. And I lived in a. I I, uh, I slept in a closet for a few months because. When we rented a place, they had a, there was a lady who had a basement and literally she had like a room, like a closet. And she rented that to me for $325 a month. When, when does the idea of the military show up for you? So I was working in a, in a store. Well, a couple of things. I mean, first I felt like, you know, this is when I came to the US and I said this and you start breathing and you feel, and this is not uh, physical, but it's more mental. And you feel the freedom. You feel like you breathe in free air. If you're gonna make this home, uh, you gotta you gotta buy your tickets into the country. And uh, joining the military to me was that. And a, 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 a few things. So uh, there was a mosque. It was like anybody, like if you go to Yemen tomorrow and you wanna meet Americans, you most likely there's a church. You're gonna go to the church. Uh, so there was a mosque there, and across the street from the mosque was the recruiting station. That mosque actually where the blind sheikh was behind the world trade, the first the first World Trade Center used to go there. There is a couple no of way. there are a couple of really, really there are a couple of really, really funny stories in the book about that. Uh, I did meet him in that mosque. I'm not gonna ruin the book, but if you want to know what happened when like I it. encountered him and uh, yeah, and what I what I what people asked him and uh, how did that go? But anyway, across the street from that was a recruiting station. So I have the idea of like, you know, this is gonna be Again, I don't want to sound like a cliche, but I was like, this is going to be, if you want to be like, if you are an immigrant, you want to be like a true American and you serve in the military, it's going to give you the street cred. It's going to give you the validation. It's going to help you 
uh, get jobs. It's going to get you good education. You're going to really live the American way of life and all of these things. So um, my dad used to be a, a safety specialist in the Egyptian Navy. We lived by the beach. And I always loved the idea of water. So I wanted to join the Navy. So I went to the recruiting station and I asked for the, the Navy recruiter. And by that time, I got my green card. So in the U.S., luckily, you can join the military you know, as a green card holder. And then the, the military has a process, obviously, uh, to get your citizenship. And, and sorry, real and, quick, Adam, uh, what year is this and how old are you at the time? So this is, was 1994. Uh, okay. I was 20. I, I was not 24. Okay. I was going to college at that time. And uh, the recruiter was like, how are you paying for college? I said, I'm working. I was working literally from uh, two o'clock in the morning till uh, about eight o'clock in the morning delivering cake. And then from, and that's a bakery. And then from nine o'clock till like five o'clock working in the lady uh, sportswear clothing. And then from six, seven o'clock in the evening till later going to college to learn English. So my day would start at two o'clock in the morning and end around 10 o'clock at night. Well, and then when you're young, you can, when you're young, I think you can do that. I'm not yeah. sure if I, I definitely cannot do that now, no, no, but the no, stuff no. that, the, the stuff that people take for granted, uh, a lot of us in, from the immigrant community, we did not take for granted the freedom we had, the opportunities we had, but to go back. So I went to the Navy recruiter and I said, I want to, I went to the recruiting station, a nice army guy. And I didn't know how to differentiate between, uh, army uniform, Navy uniform, air force uniform. So an army guy was standing there. And it says on his uniform, U.S. Army. So that's obvious. He's an Army guy. And I said, I want to join the Navy. And he's like, why do you want to join the, join the Navy? I said, I like water. I like boats. And he's like, we have boats in the Army. We have boats more than the Navy. And uh, we do a lot of things on water, too. And he's like, uh, uh, if you thinking about the Air Force, we have more airplanes than the Air Force. <laughs> the Army is the right thing for you. And he talked to me for a bit. And he gave me this, this pre asvab Scored really high in, in uh, math, scored horrible in English. And he's like, uh, but your math is high enough. I think we can, we can have you in. Uh, I think a few weeks after, I went and took the, the actual uh, ASVAB. The same day in the afternoon, they took me to the map station to pick your, um, to do your medical, to do your physical exams. And with everything goes with the physical exam, as you know. And then uh, they started offering me jobs. And I think I didn't say this in the book, but the first job they offered me was a tanker. And I asked the like guy. An like an armor tanker. An like armor, an armor tanker. Yeah. He stood in the tank. And I asked the guy, why do you think I'm so qualified for this? He's like, you're too small, you'll fit inside the tank. <laughs> so I didn't yeah. like it. I said, no, I don't want to do that. Uh, I was like, man, this guy's insulting me like from day one. <laughs> so uh, that took some time till it sunk in. Uh, I left that day and then I came back, I think a couple of months after. And that's when I signed and I was already, I was still in college. So they put me in a delay entry program. So basically you sign in and you don't go till you finish your semester. And what MOS did you end up picking? So in the beginning, it used to be 71 Lima, which is now, it's like the admin specialist. And uh, the guy was like, and then the army, the army is awesome, by the way, in a way of uh, writing the description of the jobs. So when you read that description yes. of the job, like uh, the one, the one I loved the most was like petroleum specialist. And when you read it and you're like, wow, man, this is awesome. I'm going to be like a, an oil engineer one day. I'll go work for like uh, uh, Shell oh, or like British yeah. Petroleum. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I told the guy, what's up? petroleum specialist does and he explains it. i was like dude so basically he's like a guy working in a gas station i did that job already <laughs> so uh but I, so i ended up coming in as admin uh my first job i think i didn't do a lot of admin work because i was uh first assignment was fourth hood texas in a military police unit and they're like this guy's fit he can run he can do this he can do that uh, i worked in the in the orderly room but uh i was doing that and doing other things but first first mos was uh was what what you used to be seventy one Lima? I'm not sure what it is. What do you call it now? Yeah, so so like the the pack clerks working in the S one shop, kind of helping out Correct. with ad administrative things. Okay, interesting. So in basic training, I think uh, a lot of people don't think it's the right decision uh, because basic training is designed that way. 
but if you i tell everybody like if you can suck it up and drive on uh the and now hindsight 2020 i was like oh that wasn't really bad but at that time most likely it was bad especially yeah. again i did not i was a guy who was in the us at that time for about four years uh not you cannot learn the language to to a certain extent in uh in four years uh so i go to fort jackson and uh the drill so i i lost my airport i lost my earplugs and i'm terrified because they yell at everybody that's 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 what they do they shout at you they yell at you uh and they're like you know the latrine is this way the chow hall is this way you know your canteen is i'm like what the fuck is a chow hall like literally i was like seriously <laughs> so when i lost my earplugs in reception and i want to go to the drill sergeant and say you know i lost my earplugs but i don't know what earplugs is in english literally and I was like, I lost this. And I have one. I lost the other one. And the drill sergeant was like, say earplugs. And I'm like, say earplugs. He's like, no private, say earplugs. I'm like, say earplugs. And I looked like the dumbest guy on the planet. The drill sergeant was kind enough. And he's like, earplugs. So he took say out of it. <laughs> and I was like, earplugs. And he was, this is honestly how they start, how I start learning. Just a quick word from our sponsor, Mint Mobile. And we'll get right back to this combat story. Have you ever thought about why your wireless bill is so damn expensive? It's all just radio waves and how much can a radio wave really cost? Seems like big wireless got together and decided, 100 bucks a month? I think they'll buy it. What choice do they have? Now, thanks to Mint Mobile, you do have a choice. Right now, Mint Mobile has wireless plans starting at $15 a month. That's unlimited talk and text plus data for $15 a month. I wanted to read a comment from one of our listeners about Mint Mobile. And they said, just to let you know, I used your code to sign up for the four-month package at Mint Mobile, and it's working great. It was an excellent second carrier to use while traveling, good coverage and fast speeds. Just so you know, you are promoting a decent service to help support the show. And I think that says it all. I noticed the same uh, great quality as I was traveling. It worked perfectly. I still have it on my phone today, and it's worked out so well. So to get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash combat story. That's mintmobile.com slash combat story. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash combat story. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. And now back to this combat story. Uh, So I uh, went to Bosnia uh, as a green card holder. I PCS to Germany as a green card holder. I came back from Bosnia on R and R as a green card holder, and uh, drunk E8 uh, was going on R and R back with me. He made my life hell because I was a U.S. citizen. Uh, but I don't want to talk about anything negative. I want to yeah. keep this positive. Then, uh, as I was in Germany, I uh, submitted the paperwork for the citizenship, and first I was in assigned to first infantry division at that time. Uh, and first infantry division, they give you permissive TDY to go back to get your uh, citizenship. And since I was stationed in Texas, my paperwork was in Texas. So as a guy who did not join the army, went through the green card process, uh, you would call the immigration and nobody answers you. You send them letter, you do all these things. And But once I got the qualific- the criteria, I met the criteria to become a US citizen. And I was going to Texas. So I called that. They sent me this letter from the immigration, the INS office in San Antonio. So I, I called the guy and I was like, there's no way he's going to answer. Uh, and he answers. And I was like, wow. <laughs> and the guy was like, well, you know, for our military guys, and I'm not uh, promoting uh, the military being great to me. So people might think like, this guy works for the military and he wants people to join the military. I would love for people to join the military. I, like, I would love for a lot of immigrants to join the military. But I flew back to, uh, to San Antonio. I flew back to Texas and I went to San Antonio called the gentleman uh, who uh, supposed to give me the test, uh, the, the citizenship test. And he's like, oh, I'm coming down to get you. And you walk in there and you see all of these numbers and people waiting for hours. But I was, the guy was like, because you flew from Germany or in the military, well, take care of that. So I went and he gave me the test. And I remember the questions he asked me. Uh, they, they wanted to know that, you know, uh, general, uh, US government, civil stuff. And they wanted to know that you can uh, write and speak English. So he asked me to write, my car has four tires. I was like, that's an easy question. So I wrote that. And he asked me some questions. And uh, he, the guy put a suit on. It was extremely emotional. Obviously. And uh, 
after I finished, he uh, said, hey, usually we do a swearing-in ceremony once a month, but because you came from Germany, we'll ask the director of the building, he can swear you in. So we walked to, to uh, some huge office with a big US flag, and he tells the director, uh, and at that time, he took my green card from me, which is pink. It was pink. It wasn't green. I don't know why they called it green card. But uh, <laughs> he took it, and he had it in his hand as we walked to the director's office, and we do the swearing cer ceremony. Uh, they have a national anthem, and you feel you want to cry. Like, you really feel And a lot of people, anybody who became a U.S. citizen can uh, relate to that. Uh, whether it's a big ceremony or a small ceremony, you really feel it. You are becoming an American. Uh, again, not cliche. It's really how it felt. Yeah. And then the guy took the green card, threw it in the trash can. And I was like, well, do I need this to travel? He's like, no, you're, Amer you're an American now. Don't need anything. He gave me my citizenship certificate and gave me, and they give you a letter from the president, the sitting president at that time. So for me, it was Bill Clinton. And they give you a letter uh, the president of the U.S. congratulating you on making a great decision. And uh, you feel it that you become in a different person. Uh, and I, and I, like I said, most likely a lot of listeners wouldn't uh, relate to that, but hopefully all the immigrants who listen to this can, can relate to that. I remember when I was a company commander in Afghanistan, one of our uh, crew chiefs, got his citizenship. And so we did the ceremony in Afghanistan and like not a dry eye in the audience. And it's all, you know, like it's all military guys. There's no family there, obviously. Sounds like you didn't have family there for this event. Um, you're just on your own, but you know, it was us with these, with all the other, you know, soldiers and it was really emotional. So that's why I wanted to bring it up. We, you know, we rarely talk about it on this show. Um, that's pretty cool. It's, it's sad that you didn't have your family there for that though, obviously. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and it does mean a lot. Your family's there, but yes, uh, I've done, uh, you'll see it throughout the book. I was uh, not, I don't, like I said in the book, I don't want anybody to feel sorry for me because I have an awesome life. I did and I still do. Uh, but like in basic training, when the guys stand there to call their family, sometimes I would stand in line to that pay phone. And I'm like, who the fuck am I going to call? <laughs> I got no one to call. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, so th there are enough of those. Again, it makes you stronger and I'm extremely grateful. And uh, you might didn't have an immediate family and other in some of those events, but the military family had been nothing but phenomenal to me. You're kind of on your way to, did you say an MI, MOS change? Yeah. So I was, uh, I called the interrogator branch and I told the guy I want to change to be an interrogator. Uh, and he's like, what language? I said Arabic. Uh -huh. And he's like, I uh, wouldn't have any need for Arabic. That was 1999. And I was like, you didn't have any need for a, a guy who's 3'3", three, three, native Arabic speaker. Uh, hopefully I can get my clearance easily because I'm clean. Uh, and he's like, nope, no need. No need whatsoever. And uh, so I was like, man, what's wrong with these guys? <laughs> So I get a, a letter uh, like a month or two after from the 98 Golf branch, which is the signal intelligence. And I remember extremely well the branch manager, her name was Sergeant First Class Pringles. And I was like, uh, how do you spell it? She's like, like the potato chips. So I remember that very well. So the, that branch offered me a $20,000 bonus to reclass to become a SIGIN guy. Uh, wow. And then she's like, she's like, and I can do orders for you to go to, so you bypass DLI because you already speak the language. And she's like, I can do order for you after uh, AIT. So they send you again to AIT. I was in E5 at that time. Uh, and she's like, you can go to uh, Monterey, California to be an MLI, which is military language instructor. And I said, no, I want to go to Fort Bragg. And she's like, you sure? I'm like, yeah. She's like, you got to be the dumbest guy in the army. I'm offering you Monterey, California, and you want to go to Fort Bragg. She's like, uh, send me a 4187. So the 4187 for the non-army guys, it's the form that anybody fill out for any administrative action in anything yep. in the army. And uh, there was no, uh, emails were not extremely common at that time. She's like, fax it to me. I did, and I've never seen uh, PCS orders 
uh, done that fast. And now, I was before like, before you change your mind. Exactly. And I'm like, she wanted, she wanted me to do it before I changed my mind. But wait, wait, uh, why, why did you want to go to Fort Bragg? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> so I believe, uh, if you want to be in the army, like you get to you get to go through the tough things. I love, I love the the extra mile thing. I love the doing the extra stuff. Fort Bragg for me was like home of the special operation, home of the. For anybody who was in the army, some people are not gonna like that home of the division, which is the eighty second airborne division. It's the only division in the army, according to eighty second guys, and uh, and I wanted to go to airborne school. Uh, I wanted to jump out of airplanes. I was like, I did not join the army. With all respect to all the yeah. MOSs. But I was like, I didn't want to, I didn't join the army to, uh, to sit in an orderly room, uh, print uh, awards. Uh, so that's why I wanted to go for Prague. And uh, again, I had no regrets whatsoever. As I was reading the book, there's a point where you get a briefing on the unit, but I don't think you go there right away. Can you speak to that moment? Because I've been in a similar briefing for an aviation unit like that. And it was just, it sounded so similar. Absolutely. So uh, I am in the 82nd Airborne Division, the division, best division in the army. <laughs> and uh, my, uh, and, and my, I mean, everybody tells me, like, if you can, if you, if you are a good runner and you, you shine your boots, spit shine your boots and have a hair and tight haircut and do uh, starch your uniform, you'll do well. So I'm, I'm doing well. I'm the, I'm the annoying guy who runs around formations with the guide on. Uh, so my first sergeant comes to me and he's like, hey, there is a briefing in the movie theater for some special unit. I think you should go. I'm like, what do they do? He's like, I don't know. Uh, and that first sergeant was one of the nicest guys I worked with in the army. And he convinced me I should go to the briefing. So I go to the briefing and they, uh, during the briefing, the first like five, 10 minutes, I think they tell you like, they, they have something really you know, scripted, very scripted. And they read. We are chartered by the Secretary of Defense. We do special mission. We are a special mission unit, blah, 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 blah. We're not going to tell you what we do. If you want to stay, stay. If you want to leave, leave. So I'm like, I'm staying. Um, I want to hear more. So I stayed and they, uh, so they gave me an interview. They asked me more questions. Uh, and then as they ask in those questions, uh, I'm like, you know what? My wife, we just bought a condo in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Uh, I just got the $20,000 from uh, the reclassing, the MOS. Uh, before that, I had gone to the FBI in New York for a TDY to translate the Al-Qaeda manual and to do some other work that we're not going to touch on here or in the book. So life is good. And I'm jumping out of an aeroplane a couple of times a week, and I'm getting paid for that. So I'm like, this is really cool. I don't want to go anywhere. And uh, so we were getting settled, and I had just gotten... Uh, married. I was like married at that time, I think for a year. So I was like, do I really want a PCS and move? So they gave me a packet. I took the packet, put it in the trunk of my car. And I was, I think because I had just re-enlisted for the new MOS, I was like maybe halfway through. And I'm like, you know, after two years, I just might leave the army uh, and do something else. And then, uh, so I took the packet, did not do anything with it other than I left it in my trunk. Uh, we were in a field exercise. We went a couple of days before 9-11. We came back the morning of 9-11. Mm -hmm. uh, so you've been in the field. You've been in the field for three, four days, five days. You were jumping. You have camouflage on. You stink. Your weapons needs to be cleaning. And we're sitting down cleaning weapons. And then that's 9-11 uh, in the morning. My wife is sleeping home. Uh, I'm sitting there. And then we start hearing that there is an airplane hit the World Trade Center. So the first one, a lot of people, us included, thought it was an accident. Then the second one, everybody knew it's not an accident. Uh, then the third one, then we were like, okay, we are, uh, we are at war. Uh, the recruiter who gave me the packet called me, I think the day, two days after, and he's like, hey, we were wondering uh, if you plan to send us your packet because with everything changed now, we are more interested in your packet. And I was like, you will have it. Uh, early next week. Everything Why? changed. Why do you say uh, that? I felt I have a double obligation. Uh, I had an obligation as a, a Muslim American that I do understand most likely the enemy more. Uh, it's uh, my new country. I felt like I should defend it. I had the tools um, and the understanding to do more in that area. 
uh, and I couldn't leave the army when uh, the army just about to start the long, and we didn't know obviously it was going to be the longest war in our history, but I could not leave at that time. So I was committed and uh, I called my wife even when 9-11 happened and we had memories because we lived in uh, Jersey, which overlooked New York City. We have pictures with the World Trade Center behind us. The World Trade Center for, the World Trade Center for us were uh, a symbol of how great America is. So yes, that, that was uh, no no brainer for me to stay. Adam, was your wife um, also of, was she Egyptian, American, um, immigrant? What, what was her background? So she uh, she's from Egypt. Uh, she came to the U.S. to Fayetteville, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. So we got married and she came. And it was the, talking about a cultural shock when I came to the U.S., I think it was bigger cultural shock for her. Going to Fayetteville. Came, arriving to Fayetteville at uh, around uh, 10, 11 o'clock at night. She uh, obviously uh, had a lot to learn. Wow. Okay. So th- this is not an easy decision, but sounds like you you had this d- double obligation that you were going to to do something. And I, I got to say, I'm pretty impressed that the unit dug up your application and was like, hey, get in here. Like everybody's doing their part the days after 9-11 and it sounds like they did theirs finding you again. Yep. I do, and I and I do till now. Extremely grateful for uh, the opportunity. Uh, the guy who was the recruiter became my detachment sergeant later on, and he uh, just an amazing human being all around. The only thing is, he used to speak very high level English, and sometimes I used to be like, "Can you just tone it down a bit because I don't understand <laughs> more than three sol- three syllable words." <laughs> Oh. Uh, but everybody knew how intellectual he was, how smart he was, and he was very strategic. You know, obviously you can't say much about the the process. You you mentioned your mom had been training you for selection without knowing it, but um, this is post 9-11, obviously. So I got to imagine they want to get you into the course quick, get you to a unit and start leveraging your skills. Although that was like most likely a priority for them at that time, but standard was a higher priority. Yeah. They did not take shortcuts. Uh, so I, I ended up going to selection and what I did in the book again, so selection is class, it's not classified. What happens in selection is not classified. So I would assume anybody could go out and talk about selection and tell people what happens in it without any consequences. What I did in the book, I mixed between selection and training. Uh, I took snippets from here and there to maintain the integrity of the selection process to offer everybody the same opportunity I was offered, which is like the element of surprise, the element of unknown, uh, unknowing, or not knowing. And uh, some people ask me about selection even in the last couple, couple of days. What do you think? How do you think I should? I, the best question I tell, the best answer I tell everybody, go with your uh, eyes wide open without doing G2, without basically collecting intel on selection. So uh, that's why I mix the selection and the training. Yeah. Uh, but what I... What I can say is between the two of them, it takes about uh, a year plus out of your life. Uh, but you learn a lot about yourself. You learn about, the, you learn about the people you are with. You learn about all of these different things. And uh, again, it's an, it's an experience of a lifetime. If anybody is invited, offered the opportunity to go, I would hire you. You make it through selection. Sounds like it's probably 2002 at the time, or is it 2003 by the time you get out? By the time I leave training and selection is 2003. 2003. What's it like arriving to the to your first unit, being the new guy coming into this unit? Is there any is there any hazing uh, issues that you have to go through, or is it no? Just get in here and, and get to work. I think I had more hazing when I went to the 82nd, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> when uh, when I came to the unit, there was no. I wouldn't say hazing, hazing, but you are the new guy. So as the new guy, uh, you gotta you gotta just sit, shut your mouth, and open your ears, uh, which is the right thing. It I mean, is. You have people who you have people who done this before you. You have people who have a lot of experience over you. Uh, it's good to say and listen. But it didn't take two months from graduating selection to my first deployment. Jeez. But uh, I have a good team sergeant. I have a good team. Uh, I had a female supervisor. She was an operative as well. And she uh, 
she, she did whatever she can to do to prepare me to make sure that I'm ready to go. And if you go to, whether you go to selection, you go to the unit, you go to training with an ego, you won't, you won't succeed. So you got to leave your ego behind. And like I said, uh, just open your eyes and, and your ears and, and, and learn and listen and follow people who done it before you. You know, we mentioned the unit. This is very secretive. Can you give people a high level of what it is you're responsible for when you're deployed without obviously giving away the sources and methods here? So first of all, I think I said this earlier. I want to say it again. The unit here is not Delta. We are yep, not Delta. Exactly. Uh, so I wanted to make sure people know that. But uh, you, uh, you have, a, you have it's a combination between uh, intelligence collection and a special operation. Uh, capability. So you can do a lot more than a lot of people think, but you you are the gray guy. You're like the guy who uh, operating in the in the gray area with thinking outside of the box. And the training and the selection process prepares pre- really prepares you that for prepares you for that. And basically you are given a set of problems and you gotta find solution. And because the unit command uh, gives you a lot of the uh, freedom to operate and gives you like the opportunity to think in your own feet and they, your own feet and they trust you. You can come up with solutions way outside of the box. As long as you're not intentionally trying to do anything wrong, they got your back. And that's something that helped me out a lot. I uh, used some equipment. I think most likely the equipment was worth over to dollars $200,000, but nobody had used them in the extreme heat of the desert before. And I put it in my backpack and I did what I did and it burned. And you would think, dude, this guy just wasted a hundred to hundred thousand dollars worth of equipment, and the unit would be like, no, 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 we'll fix it, we'll send you a new one. So there was no, uh, there is no zero. It's not a zero tolerance uh, uh, organization. But I think that's good. This kind of kind of blend of special operations and and intelligence, I think that's good enough for people to understand high level what what we're talking about. Just before you deployed, because it was so early on still, like 2003, what was the discussion between you and your wife as you're getting ready to go out on your first deployment? So my wife had, uh, in the second week of selection, my wife my wife had just given birth to our first daughter. So, uh, and the unit, by the way, at that time, they said, hey, we know that your wife is pregnant. We can uh, curtail you. We can postpone you for another year. And then you can come next year. And I was like, no, I'm not wasting this opportunity. And I don't think we have enough time to postpone things and to waste things. Uh, so then when I was deploying, my daughter was not a year old yet. My first daughter was not a year old yet. Uh, so we had this discussion. Like I said, my wife got my back 100% from day one. Uh, I think 9-11 again uh, switched a lot of things on for all of us. Uh, I think uh, Arab Americans... What a lot of people didn't think they were more affected because you were affected by the just the terrorist attack itself, and you are affected by all of a sudden everybody looking at you like you don't belong here. Mm-hmm. So you had you had two sides that you have to not to fight, but you had two sides that could be your potential. If you are in the military, some of the uh, Arab Americans they think, well, you're going to fight your own people, and uh, when you are in the military, some of the guys in the military they think, well, you. you you're not one of us. So that challenge, but again, we're not, we're keeping it positive. So uh, that discussion with my wife. So my wife was like, you know what? I'm just gonna, uh, I couldn't leave her by herself at that time. Uh, so she ended up going to Egypt while I was deploying uh, to just have the family support. I just have a brother in the US. So we didn't have a big family uh, to have that, to provide us with that family support in the US. So we had to kind of like juggle between having family from Egypt come or having my wife go uh, while I'm deploying. So it was, uh, I, I don't want to say it was stressful. It was just, it needed a lot of uh, balance and management. I had a son who was about eight months old when I deployed the first time. And my wife and I had been married for for many years before that. And I also had a child born during the most stressful part of our training at the farm. And <laughs> And they were like, all right, we could just, you know, like you could just come back for the birth and then we'll just set you back another class. You wait several months. And my wife was like, don't you dare miss that. Like we've been through all yep. this already. You better pass that damn course and come back. So I, I, I get you. When, when you deploy, 
Adam, that first time. Do you? I don't know if you remember your first time outside the wire on your first operation. We don't have to get into where it was or any of that, but the emotions, like what's going through your head? How worried are you, if at all? Like what? what is your thought process at that time? So I deployed to non-war zone in the, my okay. first deployment. It was a country in the Arabian Gulf. But we were uh, going tracking some of the AQ uh, guys in, in that region. So if I tell you AQ what, you will know which country. So I'm not going to say yeah. that. But uh, from the time I took the flight out of the U.S. And you're like, you're really thinking, like, who's, who's out there to get you? And I had an older lady sitting next to me on the flight. And I, I love old American women who love to talk on a flight. And she asked me every question on the face of the earth. And I was like, is she like out to get me? Is she like, did they plan her? Did they plant her? Is she, and she's asking questions. And I would tell her, lady, please. I mean, she's so sweet that you cannot be rude to her. And I would tell her, please stop asking me questions because I might fail the test. Uh, then I landed and uh, the guys from my team picked me up. And I was still learning. I mean, like I said, you learn. It's like when you go to college. You learn things in college, but when you start practicing, it's totally different. And I remember a, uh, one of the operatives was a Mexican-American guy who, uh, who knew the equipment inside out. So we would go out. He's driving, and he's telling me, turn this on, uh, go to menu, do this, do this drop-down menu. And I was like, is that guy looking at something while he, as he's telling me that, or it's out of his head? And it was out of his head. He's like really memorized it. He really knew that, knew what needs to be done. And he was so calm, so collective. And I'm like, this is what this is the kind of people I want to learn from. Yeah. Uh, and he was the first guy taught me something in a deployment. Uh, I'm still grateful for what he's done. But uh, if anybody graduates a course, whether it's Delta, whether it's the farm, whether whatever course you graduate and you think you're gonna just hit the ground running without somebody holding your hand. Uh, you're gonna you're gonna fail. So uh, having these people around were extremely helpful. How worried were you or concerned at all as you're moving in this new? You know, you said it's not a war zone, but still, you're running around in a foreign country tracking people. W was it a little easier for you, having grown up in Egypt, having come to the, to New York without knowing anyone, like now being thrown into this kind of chaotic environment? Was it a bit easier, or was still a bit nerve wracking? So while it wasn't, again, I want to make sure that this is clear. While it wasn't a war zone, it was extremely hostile yep. uh, location, extremely hostile location. Uh, and then again, you, would, you didn't know who's your friend, who's not your friend. But me understanding the language, uh, looking like them, uh, I can move around. I can go. If I don't take my American passport and wave it, nobody would know uh, what nationality I am. And people would think... Um, uh, Yemeni, I'm Iraqi, I'm Saudi, I'm Egyptian, whatever. Uh, but they wouldn't think I'm an, an American uh, special operation guy. The size of my body helped me as well. Like I'm, a, I'm, I'm I come across like a no threat. Uh, mm -hmm. It was helpful sometimes and not helpful sometimes because people are like this guy's no threat. We can, uh, we can push him around. Uh, but yeah, in 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 operating in that environment, and ended I ended up being there for three months. Uh, you are out doing things. You are, and uh, we had some affiliation with the embassy. So the host nation will send uh, security with you. And obviously, the security was not security. They were guys like to collect. You being a street smart, you understand them, the culture, and you have these conversations with them, and you talk to them about their family, about their friends. That opens a lot of doors for you. So it helps you. Uh, so, yes, growing up in Egypt, Coming to the US, not speaking English, uh, selling vegetables in the streets of Egypt, all of those things combined uh, made me who I am. Uh, and, and it made it very helpful for me to operate in that environment. Does the Arabic that you grew up speaking and that you knew give you away at all when you're in these other environments? The way that, you know, like your English accent might if you're an American in different places? Correct. It does. Uh, I was. I was good enough to pick other dialects. So I, I passed like a Syrian in, in some locations. Uh, I, would nev I never passed like a Moroccan or Algerian because of their English, their Arabic is very different. Oh, but uh, it, it does give you away unless you pick another dialect. But if you, if you talk for long, obviously people will pick on it. So people will, and because there are 
uh, Egyptians are one third of the Arab world. Okay. So there are Egyptians everywhere. Uh, so you could be in Lebanon and you find Egyptians there. So people don't, don't, uh, they don't suspect that you're doing something outside of the norm. In, in that first three month deployment, do you have any close calls in that one? Personal, like your own personal security, um, any successful operations? Like, is it, is there anything you think back on from that first deployment that's very memorable for you? We have some, it's close call, funny, ironic, <laughs> all, all the above together. So we're we'll going from, we're going from the capital city to a coastal city because that's where the flood of the terrorist guys coming from Africa were coming, crossing to that country. And uh, as we drive in, and it's four of us, uh, myself, I was driving, and we had uh, an Italian American uh, uh, officer with us. He's sitting behind me. We have the Mexican American guy sitting next to me. Uh, again, super smart guy. And then we have uh, a six four six five, a white officer with us in the back. He can stick out from two miles away. They all super nice. They all great. So we drive about seven eight hours to go to this coastal city. And obviously, Garmin GPSs don't work well in these regions because there are no clear maps. <laughs> and as we drive in, we get into, uh, I make a, I don't know if it's a wrong turn, wrong turn or a right turn, but it was a turn that I made. And all of a sudden, I see a long street of uh, AK-47s, grenades, RPGs. I mean, you call it, it's hanging there on front of stores. And it was the, basically, it was the, the arms market in that city. And they see an SUV come in with four people who definitely, who certainly don't look like from there. So a guy comes and I'm terrified. I'm like, you know, we're going to fucking get caught. You know, we're gonna get a guy comes and I said, where are you going? So in Egyptian Arabic right away, I said, we are lost. He's like, obviously you are lost. And I'm like, well, we're trying to go to this location. And the guy's like, okay, I'll take you through. And the street, once you go in, it's tiny. You cannot make a U-turn with this big ass SUV. So this guy in the sideboard of the car, he jumps, he's chewing cot. Uh, it's a drug, right? He's chewing cot. So his mouth has like a racket ball. Uh, he's hanging uh, in the side of the car. Um, I roll down the window and he's talking to me about taking me to the other side. People stop and ask him like, what then? He's like, oh, they are lost. And I'm like, I told uh, the white tall officer in the back, I said, please just duck in as much as you can. And I'm like, please, God, don't make that guy look inside the car. And having the Mexican-American, and I'll, I'll refer to him as Mike for now, uh, sitting next to me, he looked like an Arab guy. And he, uh, his Arabic was good enough to speak. Uh, if the guy asked him something in Arabic, he could answer. Luckily, uh, I, the guy, I'm, I'm, uh, I understand the culture, so I started making jokes with the guy and keeping him talking and I, <laughs> took us to the other side of the street and then jumps off the car and we, we go off. And I'm like, this was a, if that guy, and we are inside in uh, an arms market. So they were not short of weapons. They were not short of grenade. They were not short of anything. And I was like, if these guys just drag us down the street, they can the four of us. And uh, the fear I had all the time was I'm going to get not just killed. I'm going to get tortured more than everybody else. Because these Arab guys would be like, dude, you betrayed us too. So fuck you. Wow. So that was stuck in the back of my head all the time. Yeah. That, that feeling of being on your own out there, like, yeah, there's two of you, but it's not like <clears throat> you've got an armored convoy of, of folks, like you're rolling down the street in Iraq, you know, it's very much on your own doing this thing. And yeah, it's got to weigh on you all the time. What's going on around you that, you know, just trying to, to detect if there's anything out of the ordinary. It's got to be constant. Correct. Correct. And it gives you a lot more self-awareness of, of, uh, and situational awareness of what's going on. Because like you said, you don't have these big convoys around. You don't have, uh, you don't have an, uh, a helicopter flying on top right. of you going to get you. You don't have, as a matter of fact, you don't have anybody around. You don't have any friendlies. And uh, I would say it would have taken anybody seven hours driving to be where we at. Uh, we were... When somebody says, like, you know, I can say, I can say this because I'm from Egypt. So you, when somebody says you are in bumfuck Egypt, <laughs> we were in bumfuck Egypt. <laughs> uh, I bet that was interesting the first time you heard that phrase. You're like, what does that mean? 
Yeah, I was I'm... like, guys, what's bumfuck Egypt? <laughs> but yeah, it was it was interesting. <laughs> I'm learning. I've learned some. <laughs> uh, one of the things I noticed in the book, you mentioned that you get shot at some point. Can you speak to that moment? We we were in Africa in a in a mission. We were going in and out of some countries. A week before that, we had a very close call ambush, uh, semi ambush. So in that mission, it was a mix of uh, us and uh, TF Blue Navy SEALs and some uh, non government uh, other government agencies, some OGA guys. <laughs> so you would know. There was, so we have it was about six of us. And uh, because of that, we had some, uh, we, we've heard after that in some of the intercepts that were, uh, we got that these guys, uh, they were planning and in, in killing the six white pigs we just landed. And I was like, I'm not white and I'm not a pig. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, the other guy who was with me from the unit, he's again, uh, he's a dark skinned guy from a, a Latin American country. And so we go back to uh, the, the country where we were based out of. Uh, and I think that what happened is they froze because of the intercepts we got. So they knew who was trying to do what. And one of the guys was a Somali-American. Uh, one of the guys were planning the ambush. One of the terrorists was a Somali-American. So they froze his, I think they froze his bank account in the U.S. His wife, it's a very small world. And his wife knew the sister of one of the interpreters that we had with us. Clear Cat 3 TSSCI interpreter. So they somehow reached out to him uh, to meet him. And he didn't say anything, but as soon as he knew what was going on, he freaked the heck out. And that was a Tuesday. So I was a senior op at that time. He finished dinner with that lady who told him, like, here's a phone number. Uh, my husband wanted to talk to somebody from the embassy, blah, blah, blah. He has some stuff to report. So he left that meeting freaking out came straight to my house. So older guy uh, didn't know really what he was doing, not knowing maybe they were surveilling him or not. Two days after uh, I was coming back into the house and uh, I get ambushed by the door of my house and somebody shot, shot me. And uh, the adrenaline goes in. And so you, I, you see the guy, the guy doesn't, doesn't try to rob you or anything, but I get out of my car and a guy stand behind me and he, he shot me, so we get into this fist fight. At five to 15 minutes, most likely we are fighting. Uh, some other guy, so I get, a, I get a hold of the guy, some other guy out of the, that the guys were doing the ambush, one guy comes and he punches me with the, the bottom of his gun in my chin. Uh, I felt a bit off balance, they ran. Uh, and at that time, I didn't know I got shot. I was like, he missed. And he was like six feet away from me. I'm like, that dumb ass just fucking missed. But I felt like a, a small pinch. And I was like, just a ricochet. Uh, he didn't he didn't really get. And then when they ran, I go and I put my hand in my stomach and I'm bleeding. And I feel like, you, you feel like it's hot uh, liquid. And I'm like, that motherfucker just shot me. Uh, so I uh, knock on the door. I tell my buddy who's inside the house, my roommate, housemate, who's another operative. Uh, and I was like, dude, open the fucking door. I'm shot. So he opens the door, uh, we had a maid, we get some, uh, so I was like, hey, please call the embassy, have him send an, an ambulance. And I tell him right away, I'm like, hey, by the way, just calm down, I'm not gonna die. And I, I didn't know if I was gonna die or not, but I needed to stay, I needed to stay calm and composed. Uh, and I was the senior guy, so I wanted to make sure like everybody is, like they, you feel like your training kicks in and you feel like you, you want everybody to be calm. Uh, he calls the embassy, the guards start showing up from the compound we're living in. Then I sit down and I think I passed out, uh, put a towel to stop the bleed, to control the bleeding a bit. Then I would come back uh, and I'm thinking I didn't pass out. And then my buddy was like, did you pass out? So we were like, okay, I'm going to stand up so I don't pass out again. So that took some time. And then finally, I'm like, there is no fucking ambulance coming. I'm in Africa. Uh, one of the guards, uh, I go to him and I'm like, hey, do you have a, do you have a car? And the guy's like, excuse me. So I was like, do you have a car? And he's like, yeah, I have a, I have a car. So I'm like, okay, you're taking me to the hospital. So I go, I go and he has a pickup truck. So I get into the truck and I think the adrenaline is kicking in. So I'm not feeling the pain yet. Where did you get hit? So I got hit in the left side of my stomach and the exit wound was half an inch away from my spine. So uh, 
finally, this guy, the guard, he's, he's driving me to the, to the hospital. And I think he hit every speed bump and every pothole in that country because every time I would feel like, you know, my guts just drops. Then finally, we made it to the hospital. I didn't know how long did it take from the time I got shot to the time I made it to the hospital. You lose track of time. And a lot of people tell you, if I'm in a gun fight, I'm going to do this. Nobody knows what they're going to do when they are in that situation. You really don't know. And I'm assuming your reaction would be different every time. Uh, because another time with a close call, my reaction was totally different. But that time, uh, when I made it to the hospital, and I think I had bled enough. Maybe I was bleeding for like two hours or something. And you bleed them from the front and the back. Uh, and I get to the hospital and I try to open the truck door from the inside and I can't. So I tell the guy, I'm like, hey, can you unlock the door? And the guy's like, the door is unlocked. And I can't open it. And I'm like, dude, just unlock the fucking door. And he's like, sir, it's unlocked. I didn't, I think I didn't have enough strength to unlock the door. He comes out, unlocks the door. And then people from the hospital, they come and they bring this, uh, you know, this hospital... Uh, transport bag is like this high, high aluminum bag to move you in. It's not a stretcher, it has wheels, but it's it's very tall. And I'm like, how the fuck am I going to get in this? And I tell the guy, I'm like, can you drop it down? And he's like, it's broken. I'm like, dude, how the fuck am I going to get up there? So I step on the side of the car, I jump there, and I'm like, okay, this guy's going to kill me. I'm just going to die. So I go inside. And the nurse, who's very competent, and I'm like, don't put me to sleep. I want to be in control. At that time, my buddy didn't make it to the hospital yet. I think he went to change because he got some blood in his clothes. And, so you're on your own uh, at, a hosp- at a local hospital right now. No support. Yep. 100%. That's scary. Uh, and, uh, and I'm like, don't put me to sleep. I'm just, I don't, I'm just we're going we're gonna to do this. And you're thinking... As you would think in the U.S., you go to the hospital, what are they going to ask you? What's your name? What's your social security number? What's this? What's that? So I have all of these things going in my head. Uh, uh, what, are you, what are you doing here? I'm, I'm there. Uh, I don't want to get in details, like what status I'm there on. Mm-hmm. But I came to go tell these guys, um, yeah, by the way, I'm in the military or I'm yeah. this or that. So you, you got you to like, live your cover here. Yeah. You got to live it 100%. And... Uh, Finally, they were like, hey, so the nurse comes and she's going to do an x-ray and she sits me up to do the x-ray. And I feel, and I'm like, can't you just do it as I'm laying down? She's like, oh, the x-ray machine is broken. So I'm like, okay, makes sense. <laughs> of course, <laughs> everything is broken. And uh, so I asked her, and I was like, hey. And during that time, by the way, you're thinking about all of these things. My dad had passed away uh, less than... Uh, Eight months before, hmm. uh, my daughter was not three. My wife was not 30. So all this time, you're thinking, I can't fucking die. If I die, it will be devastating for my mom, for my wife, for my daughter who would never know me. So you're thinking about all of these things as you go. And uh, so I told the nurse, I'm like, hey, Looking at the entry wound and the exit wound, what do you think it hit? And she's like, your kidney. She's like, 99% it got your kidney. I said, you know what? Thank God I have two of those. She looks at me like I'm crazy. Uh, By then, a bit later, and she ordered blood. She's like, hey, guys, get blood, get this, get that. And she took charge. And she had a a British accent, so you can tell she was British educated. And she starts yelling at people left and right. She took total charge. And I'm like, okay, you know what? This lady is going to save my life. A bit after, my buddy comes with the embassy doctor. Embassy doctor is, uh, is a guy from Texas with a nice southern hospitable accent. <laughs> and he came and he's like, um, uh, there is a doctor here. He's like, well, we're going to make the vacuum to South Africa. But there is a doctor here. Um, that If he wasn't here, would have moved you. But that guy would trust him 100%. So I think the embassy people had already done surveys and hospitals around. Yeah. So this Pakistani Indian origin doctor walks in, uh, gray, gray goatee, salt and pepper hair, calm. And he's like, what happened? He talks to me very calmly. And he's like, don't worry about it. You'll be fine. We're going to open you up, clean you up, 
put you back together tomorrow morning, tomorrow morning, you'd be fine. And at that time, that's the only time I was like, okay, you know what? I'm going to let go a bit because he is somebody that I can trust. My buddy, poor guy, has to sign the next of kin. And he's like, I don't want to sign for the surgery. He's going to die. I'm like, dude, we don't have a choice. You got to sign. So he signs. And uh, my way of asking the doctor, am I going to die or not? Because I'm a brave guy, right? I mean, I'm a special operation guy. You're not going to cry and say, am I going to die or not? So my way of asking him, I was like, am I going to see you again? So I told the doctor, he's like, we're going to put you to sleep. And he's like, I was like, am I going to see you again? He's like, yeah, you will. Don't worry about it. The anesthesia doctor comes and she's like, hey, you're going to count to from 10 to 1 or something. And we're taking you to the theater room. And my buddy is like, what fucking theater room? The Brits, yeah. And yeah, and, uh, and, I, and I look at them and I'm like, where am I going? And she's like, no, no, we're going to do a surgery. So that's what they call it, the theater. My buddy's like, you're going to bring him back, right? So uh, I think I counted like from 10 to like 8 and I was out. And I think I was in surgery for about four or five hours. Wow. Woke up in uh, the ICU with, uh, I don't remember exactly who was there, but I remember some local, other local doctor was there. And he introduced himself as the, the brother of one of our local uh, contractors. Like we were operating with some people there. So these guys cared enough to send uh, their, their family. Uh, there was a, a Navy corpsman there. Uh, he was in the mission. He was, in, he was not in our team, but he came there. Uh, the, my buddy was there. My other buddy was there. So all the guys were there when I woke up. Uh, and I wasn't dead. Wow. So uh, obviously, JSOC, does a, the military in general, and again, it's not cliche, but in, in my experience, the military did a very good job. And uh, like, hey, we will medevac you to uh, Germany and finish your recovery in Germany. Uh, I was in so much pain at that time. Uh, I couldn't, honestly. And I was like, you know what, guys, just leave me here. But don't tell my next of kin. Tell I'm home. Uh, so I asked him not to tell my wife. And credit to the JSOC command, uh, they approved it. Although they, uh, it's one of the checklists uh, for, for instant, re- instant reports. It's one of the checklists next weekend has been not. So they kept that one until I made it home. My wife still disagreed with me for not having them tell her. But uh, I looked at it as uh, when she sees me, when I tell her, it's different. it was an experience and it gives you a wake up call that uh, at that time I was in my mid thirties and I was a super duper operatives in a super duper unit. I thought I was extremely invisible, but I wasn't. And uh, just one mistake can, can take your life away. Do you think that it, several questions here, but that initial attack on you, the assault on you when you're kind of ambushed, if you hadn't fought them off, do you think they would have just killed you there on the spot? I mean, they were trying to kill you effectively. I think it's very well possible because like I said, I mean, when he, he did not do anything. Like if somebody is trying to rob you, they'll come and try to rob you without shooting you. He shot me right away. And then when I grabbed that guy, I think it was like this back and forth of like, you know, maybe I could have just, uh, and I had, I had a really good old of the gun in his hand. Uh, till the other guy came and punched me. To get that guy, I, I grabbed his neck and I was like, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to let go. Uh, but it was very well possible that he could have, he could have killed me. Wow. When you did finally talk to your wife about this, did you, because this, you don't end your career with this, right? Like you're going back into country later. Um, did you have a discussion about hanging it up at that time and, and leaving the military? So it's the military, actually. Like it was a military doctor came to pick me up who... Uh, Again, the guy looked like he was 20, but he was a lieutenant colonel. So I did apologize in the book for, uh, for being like crude to him in the beginning because I was like, the military sent me a fucking kid. <laughs> but uh, again, great guy. And he yeah. told me, he's like, hey, by the way, this is, can go anywhere you want. Uh, we can uh, do medical retirement. We can get you out of the military. Uh, you don't have to stay. And uh, when I made it home a month after, and I told my wife, and then we had this discussion back and forth of, uh, 
maybe maybe you should leave. Even my brother came and he's like, well, maybe you should maybe maybe this should be uh, the sign that you you've done enough. We didn't take my wife and I like a few days to discuss this till the decision was made. No, like no, I'm staying. And I got some good job offers at that time from government agencies that I could have just um, do the medical retirement and go work there. But I felt that was like still, uh, and this was like 2006. So uh, that was like a long way still to go. You mentioned as you were talking about your reaction and how it could change. And you said, you know, you had a similar close call and you reacted differently. What did you mean by that? What was that incident? So it's really, again, now you can look at it as funny. So the military was like, the unit actually were like, hey. So it took me about two, three months on medications and physical therapy. You don't know how much your core area affect. And by the way, I did not lose my kidney. Uh, I was lucky enough. So, and the doctor was like, if you don't believe in God, you should start believing because there is no way what happened was not a miracle. So they, uh, the, the unit were like, okay, well, we'll give you some time off, a few months. Then after that, they were like, you know, we'll just have you deploy to like more of an embassy deployment where you just go to work in the embassy, nine to five, safe. relax, safe. Life would be good. You'll enjoy it. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, that was January. So I deployed in June. So I deployed about five months after. Wow. And then, uh, so life is good. I'm going to work. Uh, although the country we were in again was another very hostile environment, but from a CI perspective, more of a counterintelligence, more surveillance, more let's just fuck with you. Let's just go to your hotel room and dump your duffel bag on the floor, let you know that we watch in all of these things. And it keeps you on the edge all the time. Mm-hmm. And then one day I'm going to the embassy in the morning and I walk in and I was working on the third floor. And by the time I made it to the third floor, I just walked into the office <clears throat> and I hear an explosion and I hear a grenade. Uh, so somebody was attacking the embassy. So I was like, uh, that time I was like extremely calm. Uh, I had an idea. I was like, we went in a vault. I was like, you know, just close the vault door. Uh, we had an engineer, a civilian. Uh, he worked for another government agency as well. Uh, he was in part of our task force or anything, but he was working with me in the same office. Super nice guy. Uh, he he did what he knew how, what to do. He dropped on his knees and took his rosary out and he started praying. And I was like, well, not the fucking time to pray. Uh, now it's time to just get up. And let's uh, you have a destruction plan like you saw in the movie for the embassy in Tehran. So you have all these things in place. We called back home. We said, hey, we're under attack. We might implement the destruction plan. Uh, I had another unit guy. He was with me in the same embassy, uh, senior to me. Uh, another super calm, smart. Uh, has a lot of had a lot of experience under his belt, guy. So uh, I was like, I cannot leave Africa after being shot and come and die in this embassy. I'm like, what the fuck. <laughs> So uh, we were able to end up, we were able, I mean, it was like explosion, ex- more explosions. You hear gunfires everywhere. Somebody was trying to attack the embassy to blow it up. There was like, a, they had a plan where they hit one door of the embassy with a lot of AK-47s, while there was another guy in a, in a truck with propane tanks was supposed was trying to get into the embassy to blow it up. Uh, luckily, he didn't. He, he failed. Uh, it took us... I think we were in that situation for about maybe an hour, two hours. Then we hear this huge explosion, which basically, although, like I said, it was a hostile country CI perspective, but they, their job was to protect diplomats. So the security, the local security of that country uh, ended up killing the guys and in the, in the gunfire back and forth, they hit the car and the car blew up and burned uh, the four attackers. Uh, so I was like, well, shit happens. We saw all of this on the CCTV cameras after that. The RSO, the regional security office officer, came and showed it to us like the next day. And the area, we look at it and they had the camera. And I think I was a minute and 30 seconds between me going in and the bypasser who was walking through after me 
who got shot and killed. Wow. And uh, so the guys from the unit were like, hey, man, you are really bad at luck. We don't, wanna, we, we we don't, don't want to be around you. you. <laughs> we don't want to be around you. So uh, oh, wow. I've learned from my first lesson. And I was like, this is going to be all over soon then. So I picked up my phone. My, the phone. my wife didn't know where I was. Uh, in all my deployments, my wife didn't know what I was deploying to. So I was like, you know what? So I picked up the phone and I was like, you know, I'm just going to pick up the phone and call her and said, you're going to see something in CNN. I'm alive. I'm okay. Nothing happened to me. <laughs> so <laughs> I was like, just in case I didn't want to be the guy accused again for not telling his wife. So I, I don't want to give too much of the book away. I might just ask for two, two more topics here um, to whet people's appetite. One being the scene where you open the book, which I, I think is fascinating. And you're tracking a terrorist by the name of Aro, A-Y-R-O, in the book, at least. Um, I believe also, I believe this one is in in Somalia, if I recall correctly. But I think there's something here about the experience of being alone or with one other person tracking a known target, an HVT, lazing or, or you know making sure you got eyes on. Can you just talk through that process it, just since it's been cleared and we're not getting into anything too sensitive, but I think it speaks volumes to the work that you do on your own. And this is after you've been shot already. So like you've already had that close call. We've been tracking these guys for a couple of years and I would, uh, I would be remiss if I don't say like the first two or three operatives who deployed to that region, the guys who set the, who really set the, the, the rules, they, they, uh, they set us up for success. So they set a very good foundation. I was just a guy who, who kept deploying back and forth, back and forth. And I was there in the right time and uh, in the right location and with the right attitude, I guess. But uh, basically with all of this tracking of these guys, we had uh, our task force at that time was about uh, over 100 people. With the task force commander, who was a, a Navy SEAL, a guy with a master's degree in like quantum physics or something like a super fucking genius. We had to, re I had to relocate from where we were based out of to another location to be closer to the target. We had uh, FBI helping. We had uh, OGA helping uh, in the task force. Uh, with, with the combination of all of these things together, we were able to have a good location on where the guys are. Uh, obviously, because I didn't intentionally, obviously, we we're going to relieve, uh, we we're not going to talk about any means or methods. So I did change things a bit in the book to make sure that it's, this is clear. And again, we're not putting anybody in harm's way. But uh, I have this super duper uh, smart computer, smart guy. I named him in the book, Eddie. Uh, so he and I go. Uh, Eddie's like the suave, Hispanic guy with the nice hair. I'm the guy with the fucked up African hair. <laughs> and Eddie's <laughs> like, hey, man, how was my hair today? And I was like, there's nobody going to care about your hair. <laughs> but uh, And this is go... just the two of you, right, Adam? Like it's you two on your own in the local that's environment. The, that's just the two of us, 100%. There was uh, one other Marine was involved with us. Uh, nice, nice guy. Old had a lot of tattoos everywhere, super smart. He just was not with us in that exact location, but he was supportive of the mission as well. In addition to, we had an analytical team out of the embassy somewhere. Uh, we had linguists uh, supporting us as well, but it was just the two of us uh, in this specific environment location. But again, not uh, we cannot not give credit to, to the rest of the team who really yeah. done a great job. We even, I, I even like uh, at that level of like, you know, the McChrystal's level where he's like, you know, given us the leeway to do those things. And we didn't have the QRF in that region was about, uh, I want to say at least three hours flight. So we, we totally, totally in our own. So we have this in our mind and you, you, you think of uh, Black Hawk Down and you're like, well, I don't want to be dragged down the street. And again, I had this in my mind, what a lot of people didn't know, like, or didn't, they could not feel it, but I would feel it more again as a Muslim American. Uh, I always had this, if I get captured, I'm getting tortured a lot more than anybody else. So I, I gotta be careful. And it was Eddie's first trip uh, to Africa. So I was like, and Eddie has a beautiful family. So I was like, man, I can't, 
uh, let that guy down and I cannot let his family down. So I got to take care of this whole thing. So you have all of this responsibility. And I'm a, I think I was an E7 at that time. So again, you're not a guy with a lot of rank who's going to make a decision of uh, hitting a house with uh, T lambs, missiles worth of four or $5 million. And you're like, if you get this wrong, you are fucked, my friend. Mm -hmm. If you get it wrong, like you're wasting money. But you're also potentially, you know, killing civilians, friendlies, you know, all kinds of things could go wrong here. Correct. If you get it wrong, in addition to you, like the amount of innocent people you might get. So we had all of this intel on that guy. And then somebody goes and they're like, hey, by the way, we heard there is a mosque in that location. And I'm like, let's just dig deeper into this. Obviously, if there is a mosque, it will require, at that time, if, I, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it would have required presidential uh, to hit a mosque. So uh, we go back and forth, and I'm like, well, he has a, a house, there is a yard, and there is a room where they're praying at. So again, understanding the Islamic culture, it helped me uh, say, well, this is not really a mosque, it's just a prayer room. Everybody has a prayer room. Then in addition to that, uh, I'm like, okay, we, we, we get the guy, then we lose him. We get the guy, then we lose him. We get the guy, then we lose him. And again, uh, I look and I'm like, okay, what does a religious Muslim guy would do when he wakes up in the morning? And what time would he wake up? So you can, there are like websites where you can check the time of the prayers in that specific location in Somalia. And you can get the exact time of the prayer. And you're like, okay, if he wakes up at this time, if he's going to pray at this time, you do backward planning. He, he wakes up at this time. He's going to pray at this time. He's going to be in this area at this time. He's going to hang out with his buddies at this time. And we kept doing all of these things. And we had an awesome analyst. Big guy. Uh, I'll, if, I'll say his, uh, I wouldn't say his real name, but I'll just call him Scott and this one. But Scott is like, have the whole target package set. Uh, the linguist is working that the linguists are working on getting all the proper uh, translation of everything. And I think it was around. So I was like, okay, Fajr prayer, the early morning prayer is where we would uh, like go after the guy. Task force commander, the guy with the master's degree in quantum physics. He calls me because at that time we lost some of our assets. And he's like, hey, by the way, you can come back. And I was like, no, I, we have a feeling that we'll get the guy tonight. Don't worry about it. And he's like, hey, I trust you 100%. Uh, do what you think is right. But if you at any time feel you guys are at risk or anything, just come back. And you will not be blamed for anything. Which is great, right? That I mean, that's what you want a leader to say. That's what you want. And it, uh, like in, in, in the JSR community, that's how I always felt. And uh, that's what you want your leader to tell you. You don't want your leader to tell you, well, no, no, fuck off, man. You're going to go and do this. And Oh no, he's like, hey, you you are the guy on the you are the guy on the target. You understand what's going on. You don't have to ask for permission every five minutes. Uh, you know exactly what you need to do. I trust you. Uh, go for it. So we ended up doing that, and I think we uh, then we 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 called in the, the hit. Adam, can you the just for a second? Can you speak to how long the time of flight is? Because I think that's what's super important here that most people will not understand. It's not like a UAV overhead taking a shot that hits in 10 seconds after you call it. No, we called it and it took about, uh, I think if I'm not mistaken, it was about 90 minutes to two hours time of the flight for the missiles. And during this whole time, we can call in to divert the missile five minutes before it hits. So we can call and say, hey, he's no longer there. You can divert. Uh, so we, we kept checking Till the missile was about to hit. Uh, the missiles hit, and Eddie and I left. Uh, and we went to another base camp somewhere else. And I was like, well, let's just hope that we didn't kill innocent people. We were uh, lucky in a way where the, the spokesperson of Al Shabaab goes in, I think, a BBC, and he announced Eden Iro was killed with nine other people, uh, the only civilian was, excuse me, the only civilian was there with his, was his wife. Uh, the rest of them were like some of the guys in, 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 in the gang and they, they, we, we got lucky. I think we killed two other guys from the, the HVT list. Uh, and 
people in the community initially, they were like, you know, the French did it, so and so did it, so and so did it. The U.S. military did an announcement and they said the U.S. military. You know, you mentioned because the time of flight is so long and you're constantly watching the house, right? Like, has he left like he's done so many times and just continuously updating, hey, he's still there, he's still there, jackpot, jackpot, jackpot. And you were saying that it's it's a bit unnerving because you have all this time to think. Like, you know this missile's coming in. Like, who else is in the house? Is it a wife? Are there kids there? You've got kids at home, obviously. Like, you can appreciate the innocence there and how it's a lot different than being in a gunfight, maybe. Correct. And and like you said it too, you have all the time in the world to think. And uh, and you think. <laughs> I mean, you'll, you'll think and it's uh, quiet everywhere around you and you're just waiting. And then the analyst, the, the, the gentleman I talked about uh, earlier, he, uh, a- after the hit, he sent us images of the compound before and after. Uh, and it was totally destroyed, obviously. Uh, the compound got hit with a $5 million worth of uh, missiles. So it, eventually, Adam, you decide to get out of the service. You retire, leave. What was the decision there? What, what made you decide to finally hang it up? I did. When I retired, I did 21 years. So I was like, okay, and that was uh, five years after Bin Laden got taken out. So I was like, you know what, we the, the war is uh, coming to hopefully to an end. Uh, I've done my share, uh, getting older. Uh, we trained other people to do the job most likely better than what we were doing. It's part of life that you progress and you progress and eventually you uh, you leave room for uh, the, the next generation who uh, in my last job, so I retired as a, as a command sergeant major and we were visiting troops in different areas uh, in different uh, military uh, bases. And I've seen some of the smartest young people and I was talking to a, a female E5 and she's chatting. She's extremely smart talking about, she was an analyst telling me about all of these cool things that she can do uh, and she was an Intel analyst. And I was like, and she looked really young. And I was like, you know, how, w- when were you born? And she was like, I was born in 1995. And I was like, that's when I joined the army. It's time for me to go. <laughs> One of the things I wanted to ask, I guess it's out of time sequence here, but what was your experience as you were watching the, uh, you know, the Arab Spring, Egypt, 2011, you know, family there, no doubt. Uh, it was an, it was one of these bittersweet things. I believed, uh, the, I believe the regime in Egypt should have changed a long time ago, just because, and, and again, we didn't want, obviously we didn't want the Muslim Brotherhood to take over. Nobody wanted the Muslim Brotherhood to take over. Not nobody, but the majority of the people didn't want the Muslim Brotherhood to take over. From the book, you'll see that I had interaction with the Muslim Brotherhood or, uh, fighting with the Muslim Brotherhood since I was a kid. Uh, there was a lot of back and forth, back and forth. So I was, an even, I was even more of a, an anti-Muslim Brotherhood. But again, the Mubarak regime uh, had an opportunity uh, after the peace accord with Israel to uh, invest in education, to educate the population, to build infrastructure. The country is no longer at war. Uh, and I think he missed that opportunity. So seeing what's going on, what was going on in the Arab Springs, like I said, it was like, you know, it's about time that people will have freedom and will be able to speak their mind, will be able to dream, will be able to have hope. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of that really still didn't even, we didn't see, I don't think we saw the result of it yet. But I was sitting down and watching this on TV and uh, seeing, uh, again, the lack of analytical thinking in the Middle East. So some of the TV channels from the Middle East were able to play the population. So they will uh, go and say, well, you know, there is a Tahrir Square going to have like, you know, a million people and the police is attacking them. A lot of the media outlets from the Middle East were playing. It was not, they were not reporting the actual truth of what's going on. And that even made the Arab Spring, uh, made the made the demonstrations worse than it should have been. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were able to control the narrative uh, and play with the narrative and not tell the truth. And I think that affected people. But again, I do, at least I was lucky enough to have proper education in the U.S. to be able to think uh, clearly in those areas. 
You know, one one of the things that you had mentioned before we started here was there's there's an element of this book that was important to you in terms of mental health and what people like I'm sure unit operators like yourself go through getting shot, being on your own for so long, deep in enemy territory, three hours for a QRF. Um, what what were some of those things that came to mind as you were writing this book that were important for you for the veteran community? So, um, yeah, and that's awesome, honestly, question. And I, uh, I'm, I hope that we can close in this very, very important note. So one couple of things, right? Uh, so the special, they, they have the, the operator syndrome, they call it. Uh, and I did talk about it in the book. Uh, you, you go to an organization, very small, uh, very, the camaraderie is, is huge. You got, the guys are uh, like truly a family. You deploy three, four months in and out, in and out, in and out. Where in the big army, when you deploy as a unit, you come back and then they take you through this psych evaluation, uh, like the, the process of uh, R&R, the process of like everybody going and leave. The, the JSOC community, the special operation community in general, doesn't have, didn't have that at that time. Hopefully they have something now. Didn't have that at that time. So it's not just because you deployed in, in hostile areas, you have uh, mental health uh, issues, but you could have mental health issues too without deploying to these hostile areas. You gotta realize that you live the, uh, and you would relate to this just because of the, your background in, in the agency. You live a lie long enough, and then you're supposed to think that your brain will switch on and off from that lie. Uh, and you're supposed to be mentally fine all the time. And then because of your clearances, because of your, uh, the community you came from, you're this muscular, macho guy, you cannot go and tell somebody I have an issue. Uh, and then as a military in general, like it's extremely uh, unfortunate that we're losing 22 lives to suicide a day. And I don't think we are doing enough. Uh, I don't think uh, that uh, the country they see you on Veterans Day on any other day. They see you in uniform and they tell you, thank you for your service. What does that mean? And a lot of people don't realize the sacrifice that um, uh, open, like regular military guys do, and even more so the sacrifice that the special uh, operation community guys do, because you're not going to be able to go sit on a, in a bar, have a drink, and tell people, let me tell you uh, what I was doing. And, and you, need, you need this talking uh, to get things off your chest. Uh, so I think having uh, some sort of a, a system or some sort of a social system that to support the guys in the community as they, as they uh, transition from the, the community to outside of the community to the outside of the military is something that we, we should do something uh, about. And it's a lot more than thank you for your service or it's a lot more than giving you a ribbon or giving you an award or it's i think it, there is a lot more work that we need to do and we're not gonna have the government doing it on their own i think us as a community it's okay for us to reach out to somebody and say hey how are you today without asking you for anything just uh, this body check just checking people yeah. uh, having this social network uh it's it's very helpful to to a lot of i think it will be very helpful to a lot of people yeah. and hopefully the the unit and the JSOC community now is doing a better job yeah, it's it's so true. The operator syndrome you mentioned. We're in, in a few weeks. We're going to interview a gentleman named Chris Frew, who's written a book called Operator Syndrome. And um, actually, one of our former guests, Derek Natalini, who is a unit operator, um, a Delta operator, suggested I get in touch with him, and he's going to kind of talk through the rubric, the framework, and only a small piece of it is PTSD. There's traumatic brain injury, PTSD, but it's this: how long you've been away living a lie for the, so long, being around the elite community, um, losing people to, to death in combat and suicide, all of these things build on each other to create what they're calling operator syndrome. It's the first time I'd heard it. And then you just used it. Like, I don't know if anybody else has used it on my show before. So it sounds like it's gaining traction, which is great. And I think your book is going to highlight another aspect of that, which is truly the being out on your own component, which is different than a lot of units that we talked to, a lot of guys we talked to who are downrange in close knit SEAL teams with air cover. Um, it's just a different other type of dangerous and mentally challenging taxing 
experience. To the, to the same thing is, uh, again, it's not uh, just losing people to suicide. It's just having that support, uh, that support the structure there is like having a, a network of networks where we can reach out to each other. But again, I think they leaving it on us to, to do that. Uh, and if you, uh, and, and people are extremely fast to judge. If you talk about it, or if you're trying to talk about it, I, I am not, I didn't write the book for the mental health issues, but I would have been unfair if I didn't mention that. And I was trying to become a voice to a lot of the guys in our organization who, and that's why it's the first book written from, uh, from one of, oh, one of, one of us, uh, then the Navy SEAL guys and Delta guys, they can go and say, Hey, oh, see this book. This is my story. Or this is my friend's story where we don't have that. And I'm not saying the guys are doing it to brag. Obviously I'm not no. doing it to brag because if I did, I would have put it in my true name. Uh, and a lot of, uh, I put the, uh, big part of the proceeds of the book go into veterans organization and go into, uh, organizations that support uh, immigrants. So again, it's not, so hopefully people can realize that again, it's not cliche, but people can realize I am doing this to help people in the community. And I was fortunate enough to be unique enough to be able to write a book uh, to show, again, that there not everybody in the special operation community looks like Tom Hanks. Definitely, I don't look like Tom Hanks. Well, perfect. So the, the book, the title is The Unit, and then the subtitle is My Life Fighting Terrorists is One of America's Most Secretive Military Operatives. And it's co-written with uh, Kelly Kennedy, which we give credit to her as well. She's written several books uh, for the military community. She's a veteran herself. Um, so it's you, you can find it wherever you want to go pick up a book, certainly on Amazon. Um, I've got a Kindle version and I've ordered a, a hard copy version coming my way. Um, there's two questions for you that I always ask everyone to get you out on this, Adam. The first is, is there anything you carried with you when you were downrange? I assume not, but I, I ask everybody this. Anything you carried with you that had sentimental value, uh, maybe a good luck charm or something that somebody had given you, you just wanted on you as you were operating? So uh, just because of, the, because of the status, what we were traveling as, I did not. But I used to move my wallet from my... Uh, right pocket in the back to my left pocket to remind myself um, I started living this other life for that mission. So uh, as you're sitting down in your butt, sorry about that, but as you're sitting down in your mm -hmm. butt, you feel your wallet. And if it's in your left side, you feel there is something different. And that would, that would remind me uh, I'm no longer the guy who's sitting home with his wife. Interesting. So that's, uh, that was my thing. Yeah, that's great. And then the last question, you know, looking back 21 years of service, um, obviously not all of it fun or uh, easy, you know, obviously been shot, probably lost friends. We haven't even talked about people that you may have lost to suicide, but just looking back on all the, those years that you committed, uh, would you go back and do it again? Uh, absolutely. 100%. Uh, I have no regrets. I actually, and I tell everybody, uh, I came I came from Egypt literally with nothing. So people say they started at zero. I started at minus because I borrowed money. Uh, but I would have not been where I'm at if it wasn't for the military. I left the military with an MBA and a master's degree in uh, international management. I, would have, I wouldn't change anything. The people I met in the military, the friends I made, the friends I still in touch with till now, uh, the guys who helped me... Uh, learn how to say earplugs or the guys who uh, gave me my first book to read and they helped me read, read it with me. They, they read it with me and they explained things to me. Uh, I'm telling you every step of the way I had somebody who supported and helped me. Uh, so no, I wouldn't, I would not change one thing. I think the only thing I might have changed, I would have came in as 11 Bravo, not as a 71. Movie. But other than that, I would have not changed anything. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. Thanks so much for the time, Adam. This has been a blast, and uh, you know I'm I'm excited to to dig into the book even further. And I think anybody who listens to this show will greatly appreciate this book just just for the way it's written. But as you mentioned, it's the first real book from somebody in this community, and I think people will find that fascinating. So thanks for taking the time to both write it 
and sit with us today and talk about it. Thank you, Ryan. And like you said, I wanted to thank Kelly for being enough patient enough to deal with my uh, ESL, my English as a second language. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ryan. I hope you enjoyed that combat story. It's definitely not every day you get to hear from someone from one of these elite SMUs. It's pretty cool that DOD went through the process and made sure that this could be published. But just the fact that they did review it, you could see what was redacted. It's a great story. If you like combat story, you're going to love reading his book. And, you know, it's getting into some work that we rarely get to see in this world because of the, the secret of nature of so much of what they do. But it is a story that's that needs to be told so that the, the men and women who served in this unit can talk a little bit more about what it was like and people can understand just how hard it was. Um, just as a reminder, please do subscribe if you're listening on YouTube. Please give us a, a positive comment in there. Give it a like. Uh, turn on your notifications for subscriptions as well so you know when we have stuff coming out. And if you're listening on audio, I would greatly appreciate a five-star review if you can do it on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. It just helps us get to more people. Um, also, we've got our newsletter, combatstory.com slash newsletter that just has a, a short weekly update with what's going on with the show, something I might be reading, a show we're watching, some military quotes, um, this day in history about military and intel history. So if you like Combat Story, you're probably going to like the newsletter. Um, with that, we got a few comments from listeners. This is on the most recent uh, Tom Moser, Tom Gunny Moser interview round one. And he, of course, is the Marine cop fighter pilot. Very unlikely path and very cool. Um, at Timothy Drennan 3412 said, oh man, this video was awesome. I got upset that it was only five hours old because I was hoping that part two had already come out. Anyways, can't wait till the next video. And I do apologize on some of these we do around one and two. I know people don't love it all the time, but just uh, preparing these, getting them ready, getting them out the door takes time. And sometimes there's a natural break point where we can have a part one and part two, and we try to, to lean into that where we can. And then at Brian Gregory 6303 says, great interview, Ryan, keep it up. As a Cold War Air Force guy, you can bet I'm tracking Russia and their sycophants at home. I love it. I have a feeling that's related to maybe some of the comments we had at the end uh, with Novani's passing. And then lastly, uh, at Brian Christopher 1776, great interview, fellas. Learned a lot. Look forward to part two. Cheers. Part two is pretty interesting with Tom. Hopefully you've heard it by the time this comes out. But he just goes into so much more detail about flying, the combat operations, drop in danger close, those things that we all worry about as pilots but have to go through. And it, it really is special. And just wait till you hear him and Mike Paco Benitez talk about their flights together. It's pretty sweet. So with that, thank you for, for listening in, for staying tuned, and for supporting us all this way. Stay safe, y'all.